Welcome to Grace today in our second service. So glad to have you here today. Uh, you know, today is Memorial Day, and, and you know, even years, uh, there was times I got it messed up. We kind of merged together Veterans Day with Memorial Day and all the mothers. But Memorial Day, uh, the thing that we need to remember about Memorial Day is this. It actually started back during the Civil War, right after the Civil War was open, over. They uh, used to go out, and uh, they would call it uh, Decoration Day, and they would decorate the graves. And, you know, back then it was very close to home. It was The Civil War happened, you know, right in, in America here. And uh, there was... They'd go out and it would maybe be a sons or a dad or a grandfather or whatever, and they would decorate and they would remember. And they would remember the, that at one time our nation was tore apart because of division. And uh, they would remember that loved one that wasn't here and the hatred and the problems that we had. And it was called Decoration Day. After World War I, though, they, uh, that day that was normally known as Decoration Day, and I know it did spread that, you know, anybody that you have that uh, had passed away, while you're there decorating the graves for uh, those that died in service, you would decorate, you know, other family members. We understand that. But the actual Memorial Day come after World War I, and it was to be a special day for us to remember those who died in, act, you know, they died while they were in the service uh, and they died in behalf of our country. And so that's how we observe Memorial Day. So I thought today that I would just do a, a time to remember. So I'm, I'm glad to be here. I hadn't preached in two weeks. I had Sam speak. He done an awesome job. And I was here that Sunday, and I got to hear him. Then last week, Jeff preached. did an awesome job. Jeff preached about uh, when do we forget God. And, uh, and so, you know, on the heels of that, I'm, I'm talking about a time to remember. And you know, I, I'm not, I don't have the best memory. I, I don't always remember everybody's names. And I work at it uh, trying to remember names. And today I brought this brick, and this brick's going to help me remember part of the sermon. Because you know, sometimes if you use little memory tools, it'll help you remember. Uh, it reminds me about this guy named John. John, he ran into his friend Bill, and he said, Hey, Bill, uh, you remember that I used to have a bad memory? I don't have a bad memory no more. And he goes, you don't? He said, well, what did you do? Well, I went to a seminar. And he said, uh, well, what was the name of the seminar? He said, uh, 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 wait a minute, I'll ask my wife. She was at the seminar with me. So he, he, he turned you know, back to Bill. He said, Bill, what's those uh, long, tall flowers with the thorns and the leaves and then the red flower at the end? He said, Rose, he said, thank you. Hey, Rose, what was that seminar we went to? <laughs> so now if I can just remember what that brick's for. I know it's not about the three little pigs. I mean, that's a great story. It's even kind of like a Bible story. The three little pigs, you know, one of them built his house out of straw, another built his house out of sticks, and other built his house, you know, out of uh, bricks. And, you know, bricks are the best. Uh, that's the best. The, the big bad wolf can huff and blow, but he can't, he can't blow your house down. It's like Jesus said, you know, don't build your house on the sand, build it upon the rock. When the winds and the storms come, uh, you know, your house won't get blown down, won't get washed away. And uh, so, you know, but that's a great story and you can tie it to the Bible, but that's not what I want the brick to help me remember today. The other is another great story that I thought about a brick is... Uh, there was this guy, he had to fill out an insurance form and he began to fill it out. And he was supposed to, in, in great detail, he was to explain to them why he had got such brutally injured on his job. And uh, so the guy said, uh, uh, he said, you know, I worked on this big seven-story uh, construction building and, uh, and he said, uh, I was there on that construction job and and we had leftover bricks there's the bricks again and uh he had leftover bricks and i knew i needed to get the bricks off the top floor and i just felt like you know it would take me forever to take all those bricks down you know one or two at a time or a handful at a time so i got a thinking because he said you know you get a thinking and i thought about taking a barrel with a pulley and i, I set up the barrel with the pulley and i swung it around and i took and i loaded the barrel full of bricks 
And he said, I estimated on the insurance form, it was probably around, you know, about 500 pounds of brick. Well, then I got down to the bottom floor and I had the barrel and I gave it a big pull and the barrel slid out over the edge of the building. And uh, you'll see online uh, 12 there, my weight is approximately like 145 pounds and the barrel is like uh, 500 pounds. And I'll read to you how it went from there. But he said, since I weigh only about 140 pounds, the 500 pound barrel load jerked me from the ground so fast I didn't have time to think of letting go of the rope. And as I passed between the second and third floors, I met the barrel coming down. And this accounts for the bruises and the lacerations of my upper body. I held tightly to the rope until I reached the top floor where my hand became jammed into the pulley. This accounts for the broken thumb. At the same time, however, the barrel hit the sidewalk with a bang and the bottom fell out of it. With the weight of the bricks gone, the barrel weighed only about 40 pounds. Thus, a 140 pound body began to swiftly, it swiftly descent and I met the empty barrel now coming up. This accounts for the broken ankle. Slowly, slowed only slightly, I continued the descent and landed on the pile of bricks. This accounts for my sprained back and my broken collarbone. At this point, I lost my presence of mind completely and let go of the rope and the empty barrel came crashing down on me. This accounts for my head injuries. The last question of your form asked for me, what would I do different if I ever do this again? Well, he said, what I would do different is I would let you know, please be advised that I am finished trying to do a job alone. And see, I tied that right there because see, I'm pastoring a wonderful church and I don't have to do it alone. We have some wonderful greeters that greet people. We have the coffee ministry in there. They welcoming people and giving them a good cup of coffee and and all of that. We got the sound room We've got, we got other pastors here that's been preaching. Gives me a little bit of time off. You know, not that I need time off. I'm usually sitting back there and going, well, if I was up there, I'd say that different. It, it's torture for me to be in here. I was sitting in here and, you know, Sam done an awesome job. I'm sitting back there. You know, I'm thinking. And like Jeff's preaching about God, I'm thinking. So it's kind of like torture for me. I just might as well be up here. But it gives me some time for me to think ahead for future sermons. I tell you, you don't want to miss this summer series coming up next week. It's called Time Keeps On Slipping, Slipping, Slipping Away. Time Keeps On Slipping. I'll spare you the whole song. That's next week, maybe. But, um, but it's Time Keeps On Slipping. And, um, but it's wonderful to be able to pastor a church that will, as we share the load, there again, the load, we share the load and I don't have to do it alone, that will give me more longevity as a pastor and maybe I can even preach when I'm really old and gray, not young like I am now, right? (laughs) So don't think just because I let these younger guys and the ladies uh, help ever so often, that don't mean I'm going anywhere. I'm uh, excited today though. I've had a little time off. I had time to think and plan. And today... I was thinking, rolling off of this back of the other two sermons and, and last week, when did we forget God? I wanted to say today is a great day to not only remember those that died in service, but it's a time to remember. It's a time to remember. And, and sometimes it's costly when we forget. It's costly when we forget. All through the Bible, you'll find that people set up memorials. I'm getting a little worried about our country right now because, uh, you know, I don't fully know their motive behind it. They may have some good motives. I don't like to question people's motives, but when they're going around tearing down statues and, and tearing down memorials, and I think, well, maybe they think that, you know, if we could eradicate all the memorials and all the statues that dealt with uh, slavery and war, then maybe three or four generations from now, it wouldn't be in any of the history books. There would be no places to mark that. And so pretty soon people would think that, you know, that we've always just lived in peace and harmony. That, you know, it's like been, you know, a little Rogers neighborhood, you know, everybody's happy in the neighborhood. 
uh, maybe they think that we all our life is that we just got together and sung Come By Yah. Uh, they would never know the difference. But you know, I don't know if it'll work that way because the heart of man is still deceitful. Man is still a sinner. And so, you know, you can eradicate it from the, the history books. You can take down all the statutes, but you're still not going to convince another generation that there's never been hate, there's never been fear, there's never been strife. Matter of fact, the Bible insists that there's some things that we remember, you know, uh, you know that we remember, and I want to I want to look at some of those today. Uh, and after God destroyed the earth in a flood, He told Noah, "I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth." He was, he was telling them that it's not going to happen. Then God stated, I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And, and so uh, we find that, that he made that covenant. And today, uh, how many of you in your lifetime, you've seen a rainbow? Now, I know some say, well, you know, biologically, you can look at it and you can spray a water hose and it gets the sun a certain way and you'll see a rainbow and it's kind of like you did that. But God set up that the prison of the rain and the sunshine would do that. Uh, never before that time did they talk about rainbows. And so, however it happened, God made it happen and God says, you can be sure that you can count on the fact if God says something, he will do it. And God says the earth will never, ever again be destroyed by a flood. Never again. But what happens as time goes on, people start forgetting God and they forget what God says. And there was some people like that in, in, in biblical times, they forgot what God said and they go, well, you know, uh, my ancestors tell me that one time there was this flood and it just, it killed everybody. So what we need to do, we need to set up some, some avenues, some safety. It's like some of you may have gotten your storm shelters last night. We need a safety measure. And so they said, what we're going to do, we're going to build this tower into the sky. And so they took this big base and they began to uh, develop this spiral thing that spiraled up into the heavens. And uh, they built one. Well, it wasn't tall enough. They said, you know, that actually... You know, the flood was pretty high. I don't know if that, it even covered the mountains. We got to go higher than that. So they built another one and built, and these become known as the Tower of Babel. There's not just one of them, there was many of them. The hopes was if there ever was a flood ever again, point one, they didn't believe God's word. When God said there'll never be a flood again and you go and prepare for a flood, you don't believe God's word. You forgot what God said. God said it ain't, it's not going to happen anymore, but you're going, well, just in case God's a liar, we're going to go ahead and build this tower where we can get up there. We'll build a bunch of them and your tribe and your tribe and your tribe, we can all go to the top and when the flood's over, we'll come back down. Well, they were doing this and they were consistently building them over and over again. And so God sent, uh, he confounded their language. They were in unity to do this thing that uh, they were just forgetting God and they were going to build their own way of safety. They were going to build their own way to heaven. Kind of sounds familiar today, right? A lot of people's got their own way to heaven. They got their own way to heaven, but it's not God's way to heaven. <coughs> we need to get back in God's word and see what God's word says about heaven. But he says, I make you a promise. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a rainbow, and that rainbow is a promise that never again will this earth be destroyed. And so God gave us a sign. He gave us something to remember. Memory tools are great, right? Uh, don't... Let me forget about the brick. See, Joshua tells them, in the future when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crosses the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. I want you to get this story now. 
You know, Moses one time, he goes up and they're going to crawl, go across the Red Sea. And so Moses, you know, uh, he was between a rock and a hard place and he takes his rod and he goes like that and God parts the uh, Red Sea and they go across on dry land and they get all the way across and, and then when the, you know, Pharaoh's army goes, well, we can do that. So they just followed in right behind them and then the waters came in and it destroyed Pharaoh's army. Well, see, this is after that. This is after Moses is gone. Now the new guy on the block, Joshua, is leading them. And Joshua said, okay, we got the Jordan is uh, at flood stages and we got to go to the other side. So they get up there and the first thing they do, they got the Ark of the Covenant and you got the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel and you've got the, the, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant and they go and they get to the edge there and they go, okay, Joshua, do your thing. And the water is still like it was. So they get down to their ankles. Okay, Joshua, it's good time now. And the water's not parted. They go down a little further. Now they're up to their knees. As water's still there. Finally, it says they just keep going down and down and down until they're probably like this, like, okay, Joshua, you better call on God now. We're about to drown. But they said when the Ark of the Covenant got to right there at the proper place, the water began to recede. Now, see, we don't think so many times. We don't remember what a miracle that is. There's some scientists that have done the calculation that what a miracle it was that at, at this, uh, the, the, the flooding stage of the, uh, uh, of the Jordan River and at the precise time that God told Joshua to go across and at the pre precise time that the Ark of the Covenant got to the place that God told them that the water began to recede. He said, what you forget that it would have had to have been about seven miles up stream that the water would have had to already been dammed up by the power of the Almighty God. For see, a river is running, right? It's flowing. So for it to finally start receding, it would have had to have been stopped up, not at that moment, but it had to have been stopped before that moment because that's what God does. He stops it upstream by the time he knew when the ark would get there, the ark of the covenant, which represented the presence of God. And why, when it got to where the ark would have got in the water, it began to recede. Say, so, well, what does all that mean? What I think it means is you're pretty safe with the presence of God. It, it, you're, pretty precise, you're pretty safe when you obey God and you obey what he says to do and you obey his commandments and you do what God says, you're pretty safe because they done what God said. It didn't make sense. Why don't we wait until the, the Jordan goes down? No, God says go right now. You need to go now. It's time to cross now. A lot of times we don't want to cross. We don't want to obey God. We don't want to follow God at the right time. But we need to do God's time because our time is not going to work. There's a time to remember. And so this was such a, 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 an amazing time that uh, Joshua told each one of the, uh, the leaders of the 12 tribes, he said, I want you to get a stone and I want you to take it up out of the river and I want you to build this monument, this memorial and I want you to build it there at the Jordan River. And sometimes when your kids or your family has a tendency to want to forget about God and forget about obeying God and forget about doing the things that God says, when God says do them, I want you to take them down to the Jordan and show them that memorial and those stones that their relatives, their, their ancestors put those stones there to, to cause them to remember the day that God stopped the Nile River at the right time upstream where the Ark of the Covenant could cross at the right time, at the right moment under the almighty power of God. I want your kids and your children and your children's children, I want them to remember this day. See, there's some things we should never forget. We should never forget. You know, and, and the next one is, do this and you'll be free. Do what and you'll be free? Well, I'm glad you asked today. See, there's another instance in the Bible where God wanted them to remember. This is what the Lord says about 
midnight, I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die. There will be a loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than there has ever been or ever will be again. He said, I want you to kill a lamb and drain its blood in a basin and then roast the lamb. But before you eat, take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin and put some of the blood with it. And I want you to put it on top of both sides of the door frame, Exodus 12, 22. And on the same night, I will pass through Egypt and I'll strike down every firstborn, both men and animal, and I will bring judgment, judgment on all of God's, all the gods of Egypt. And because I am the Lord, I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destruction. You might want to circle that. No destruction or plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Folks, I don't know if you know it or not. If you read the end of the book, there's some plagues coming. There's some plagues or plagues coming. There's some rough times coming. Might be important that you do what God says when he says do it and obey God. And he says, and here's the circumstance. God is a loving God and God had told Pharaoh and, and God had tried to work on Pharaoh's heart and the whole nation of Egypt. God even put a man inside, but they would not listen to him. It was Moses, the leader. He was raised in his house. Finally, they kicked, you know, Moses run away to the backside of the desert. And uh, God says, uh, Moses appeared to him in a burning bush, said, Moses, I want you to go back and lead my people out of Egypt's bondage. They've been there 400 years. I don't want my people in bondage. I want them free. I want my people free. I want you to go lead them out of bondage. Moses said, who am I? Ain't nobody knows me. It's been 40 years. But everybody I knew died. You know, I, and I, I don't even speak good. And, uh, and then who, who am I going to say he sent me? He said, just tell Pharaoh, I am have sent you. See, Moses wasn't the important factor. It wasn't Moses' name that made any difference. Folks, it's not Dennis's name that makes a difference. You know, I, I love the fact, that I was reading something the other day and it says, you know, when you usually introduce to that, I am Dennis. I love that before, because the I am is for, before the Dennis. And you know, G, God is referred to the great I am. I am Dennis, but before Dennis was I am. And I am is God, and, and, and Dennis always wants to be behind the I am because God is first and Dennis is second, or third or fourth. He's the great I am. Another little way to remember who's number one in your life. Always I am before your name. But he goes and he told Pharaoh, he said, let my people go. Well, he wouldn't let them go, so God began to cause things to happen. He turned the Jordan River into blood. He, he locusts and he done all these things. And you know, remember the one about the frogs? He, he, there's frogs everywhere. And that got, to, that got to Pharaoh. Like, oh, I can't take no more frogs. I've had all the frogs. And finally Pharaoh goes, okay, okay, I give. I give God. In the morning, when I wake up in the morning, I'll let the people go. That only makes sense to me. Why would somebody want to spend one more night in agony? Why would a person want to spend one more night with the frogs? But he did. But here's the thing. By morning, Pharaoh had changed his mind. He goes, oh, I decided I'm not going to let him go. I'm not going to let him go. You don't tell God no. You don't tell God, see, you're not in control. He is. He is Lord. We're not. He's the I am. He's always the I am before we are. He's always first and we're not. So I think God looks at it this way. I wish it wouldn't have come to this, but here's what's going to happen now. Tonight, a death angel's come into town and every firstborn male and every, first, every male uh, animal, they're all going to die tonight. But there is a way of escape for all of God's people I don't know if there was any of God's people of Israel that didn't do what God said. If they didn't do what God said, they lost their 
firstborn that night because there was a precise uh, command of the Almighty God that had to be performed and they had to go take a lamb. Not any lamb, you might say, not any lamb. It had to be a male lamb. It had to be a year old. It had to be without spot or any blemish. It had to be the best in the crop in the, uh, in the, in, of his livestock. There couldn't be any better. It had to be the best. God's making a point here. God don't want your leftovers. He, he don't want what's left. He wants what's first. It's a principle in God's word. I never forget, I went and pastored a church in Knoxville one time. Got there and, you know, th- th- this building, uh, this building could have been nice, but it was just all junked up. Down in the basement, they had a fellowship hall. And in the fellowship hall, they had all kind of junk down there. Coffee makers that don't work. Yeah, I got me a new coffee maker. I thought I'd give my old one to the church. Well, thanks a lot, you know. Somebody even brought a TV. You know one of them big, long TVs? They took the TV out of it. They put it up against this thing, and they put a nice tablecloth. It was a pretty tablecloth, but it was on a TV that don't work no more. And that was a little table. And I'm all right with being thrifty. But you know what? I went over to their house, the people that gave that, and they did not have any, they did not have any old uh, cabinets of TVs around their house that they were using for tables. I got to thinking, you know, what must people think when we give our worst, when we give our leftovers, when we give our broke downs to the church? And so I, I told them, I said, next Saturday we're going to have a uh, 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 cleanup around the church. And, uh, and I said, we're going to clean a lot of this stuff out and we're going to clean the church up and make it presentable and make it what it needs to be for God. The next Saturday showed up and me and Sharon was the only two that showed up, <laughs> me and my wife. So we opened the doors of the basement and we drug out every piece of junk. I was going to say crap, but I'm nice today. We pulled out every piece of junk that was in there. We pulled it out behind the church and we set it on fire. People come in on Sunday morning, where's all our stuff at? I said, well, everybody was here uh, at the meeting Saturday. We just, you know, we all, it was unanimous. We got rid of all this stuff and just burned it up. And it was unanimous. At church, unanimous is good, right? You're probably never going to get unanimous. It was unanimous. Me and Sharon 100% agreed to get rid of that junk. We took it outside, and we didn't just pile it up. We burned it because there was no way that junk was coming back in the house of God. So help me, I believe it was a hand of God. About a week later, we had a freeze, and the water pipe at the church, the electric went off. It was without electric for over 24 hours. You go, how could that be from God? Not in our home, but at the church, a pipe busted and wet the whole basement. Guess what? The insurance paid off and we got all new flooring, all new carpet. We got all, we got all new paint and that basement looked like a brand new church. And I really felt like it was a principle right then. You start putting your first, you start putting God first and he'll help you along. You start putting God first, you make God a priority. You put God at the top of the totem pole. You make God Lord, God, hallelujah. You make him what he needs to be and you will see God move in your behalf. They understood. I tell you what. You go buy a brand new coffee pot, buy you one and buy the church one. Don't bring us your junk. I still believe that to this day. I believe God should be first. I believe that there are things coming and God will show and God will tell us and God will have a way of escape. And it won't be going against God's word. It won't be building uh, a, a Tower of Babel. By the way, the Tower of Babel, that was overturned, you might say, on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell and they began to hear other languages and they could understand them. On the day of Pentecost. Read it. It's powerful. Very powerful. But here's the thing. 
the reason these people, the reason these people, the next morning the Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave. See, now, now Pharaoh's going, y'all leave, y'all get on out of town. We don't want to deal with you no more. Y'all hurry and leave. Just hurry and leave. But we know Pharaoh wasn't fully convinced because he went after them and that's when he got, and his men, they got buried in the Red Sea. They say you can still go over there and go in the Red Sea and you can see big old uh, chariot wheels underneath the sea right now. But he said, after 400 years of bondage, they were free. If God wants you free, there's no devil, there's no husband, there's no country, there's nobody that can stop you if God wants you free. I don't care what you're bound by. God set these people free and they had 400 years of bondage. This is the day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate as a festival to the Lord the lasting ordinance. In other words, from that point on, they were to have the Passover and the Passover meant the day that they applied the blood to the doorpost, which represents our heart, but back then it just represented the doorpost. You were to take a lamb, not just any lamb, a male lamb, a perfect lamb, a spotless lamb, a blemishless lamb, and you were to offer that and take the blood and apply it to the doorpost and the death angel would pass over. You see any significance? They observed that every year. But on, the, but on the night of Jesus' betrayal, Jesus met in an upper room with some people. And he meets in this upper room with these people. And he said, uh, they go, well, the Passover's kind of set up a little weird here. Uh, you know, where's the lamb? There's no lamb here. Everything else is here, but there's no lamb. Jesus said, I'm, I'm, I'm pointing out a new ordinance today. He said, this bread took one big loaf. He broke it. He said, this bread is my body, which was broken for you. Take, eat, do it, and remember to me. He held up red, red wine, and he held it up, and he said, this is my blood, which is shed for you. I don't know if they fully dawned on them or whether they felt like he didn't fully understand how the Passover worked or what, but when he was lifted up on that cross the next day, and it all came back to them, behold, the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And he tells us, whoever will apply the blood to your heart, he stands at the door and he knocks. And whosoever will let him in, he will come in. He'll sup with you. He'll live with you. He'll guide you. He'll protect you. He'll bring freedom to you if you'll let him in your heart. If you'll let him not just be your savior, because Jesus don't come into your heart just to be the savior. He has to be your Lord and your savior. For you see, if Jesus is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget that. If you do this, then you'll have rest. What's the next thing that'll give you rest then? The Sabbath day was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. See, God created the entire world in six days and on the seventh day he rested. He went over it and he said, he rested. That meant he just kind of, Rested. It's like, I'm going to take this brick over here and I'm going to take this brick and I'm going to rest it on this table. But here's the difference. If this brick were to represent God, if I were to rest this brick right there, it'd make that holy because where God is, is holy. If I had to take this brick over here and I put it over here and wherever I rest that, it would be holy because God is holy. That's why there's not a specific day of the week, but there is to be one day a week out of the seven, there's to be one day a week. And in our nation, primarily Sunday of that day, there's to be a day where we are to rest in God's holiness and we are to remember what God's done for us. We are to never forget. I got this machine at the house and I can look at old episodes of stuff. And I brought up the other day, the very first Little Rascals. How many of you used to like the Little Rascals? Well, they're not politically correct anymore, but I like to watch it anyway. 1931, I couldn't even believe it went back that far. 1931, and it was, uh, I think it was Buckwheat, and Buckwheat and his little friend there, uh, he didn't, his friend didn't have a mom and dad, and uh, it just kind of picks up there, and, and, and so they go, and they go, 
Boy, I sure am sad that tomorrow you're going to have to go into the orphanage. But I tell you what, I'm going to pray for you. I go, what? I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to believe God. I go, what? That's, that was on a little rabbit. And God, I'm going to pray that God would do something where you don't have to go to the orphanage. That was this week. I'm thinking, oh my God, has our nation really forgot God? And so he prayed this amazing prayer on the little rascals praying for his friend not to go to the orphanage and he just prayed and tears running out his face. God, if you just will, if you just make sure he don't want to go, he don't want to go, he wants to stay with me, but they're going to take him to the orphanage. And he's crying. And so he goes and he helps him get in bed and he's covering him up and he said, let me read you a Bible story. I don't even know if he could read because he's kind of making up the story about Noah. Then he kind of done an abbot... Costello thing because he'd ask him what the name was and he'd say it, Noah. Well, I know. I, well, you just keep saying Noah, but what is it then? You know, what is it? And uh, it was a funny little routine. But I started thinking, how far has our nation drifted from that first episode of The Little Rascals where the, almost the entire thing and what happened was like, like this big thing at the end happened where right when the, truant, the guy come to take him to the orphanage, his teacher come by and she saw what was going on and she said, no, don't take the little boy. I'm going to take him home with me. And it's like, yeah, the Lord answered our prayer. I remember an episode of the Andy Griffin where on Sunday afternoon there's nothing whatsoever to do. You know, there used to be a time, there's nothing. There wasn't a Walmart open. There was no gas stations open. There was nothing open. You didn't get your stuff before Sunday. You didn't get nothing. They wasn't nothing to do on Sunday but go to church. So we went to church. There wasn't nothing else to do. Nothing open. It was a day of rest. We rested our bodies. We thought about the Lord. We talked with neighbors. How far have we drifted as a nation? How far have we drifted as a people? Have we forgot God? Have we forgot the important things of God? But he said, if you will keep, and Jesus said, I am your Sabbath. We find our rest today in Jesus Christ. Not just a day of the week, but if you've got Jesus Christ, he is our Sabbath. He is our rest. You will not have rest for your soul. So if you want freedom from the bondages of this world, you need to come to Christ. If you want rest, he said, all you that are heavy laden, come unto me and I'll give you rest. You've got to come to Jesus. You've got to come to him, not just as Savior, but he's got to be your Lord and Savior. And so then if you want peace, you've got to do this. What do you got to do? In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. You know, that day was a very special day. He said, I will be, he said, I'll be their God and they'll be my people for I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share that one loaf. You see, if we believe in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ and him crucified, we believe in the blood of Jesus, you know, the basic fundamentals, then we're all brothers and sisters. I don't care what the name of the building is. God's even against denominationalism. He's not for that. We, we need to not look at all the things we disagree. We need to look at all the things we agree on and we need to be that one loaf that's purchased by the blood of Jesus. We're that one body. We're that one people. But I'm telling you, God wants our best, not our worst. God wants us to give our best. The thing about the, the day of worship, it was, it was on the Sabbath the first day of the week that Jesus was raised from the dead. It was the day of Pentecost was on the Sabbath, the first day of the week. Uh, soon early Christians were meeting regular on the first day of the week, the Lord's Day, they called it. We need to take a day especially and slow down and remember the Lord. Come out to the house of God. The church shouldn't be the last thing on our list but the one reason that we come and we take communion and we remember it releases us from guilt. 
I told you about Carl Manager said, a great psychologist said 83% of people in mental hospitals could go home tomorrow if they knew they were forgiven. So this huge guilt and this, this condemnation and this unforgiveness builds up on us where we're barely going. There's more people today on antidepressants than ever before. There's more people killing themselves today than ever before because they don't have freedom and, and they don't have uh, rest and they don't have peace because they don't have the Prince of Peace. They don't have God. They're never going to have peace. Well, I told you to remind me about the brick. I, I, I'm going to tell you that story about the brick now. Gavin, you can come out if you want to. I'm about to finish up here. It was this guy that he worked his way up, he said, pulling himself up by his own bootstraps. And he worked himself out of the ghetto. He didn't live that lifestyle anymore. He wasn't that kind of person anymore. He had went off to college and he had a big paying job and he had him a Jaguar. He said, you know, I've kind of made it now. I think I'm gonna go back through my neighborhood and I'm just gonna ride down my neighborhood and it's enjoy it and think about where I brought myself from. So he's driving through his neighborhood in his fancy Jaguar. He gets down to about the heart of the town and all at once a brick hits the side of his beautiful brand new Jaguar. He's furious, he jumps out of his Jaguar he stops it, screams, puts on brakes, jumps out and goes and grabs the guy and he's about to hit him. What in the world are you doing? You realize how much this costs me, how much I paid for this and I come through this neighborhood and you do this to me? And the guy goes, please, mister, please, mister. Wait a minute, wait a minute. It was an emergency. Me and my brother is homeless. My brother's over there in that wheelchair and he fell out of the wheelchair and he's on the road there, the side of the road. And I needed help. I kept trying to get people to stop and they wouldn't stop. As a last ditch effort, I grabbed a brick and I just threw it at the next car that come along and it happened to be your car. My brother needs help. The guy kind of calmed down a little bit, kind of remembered where he came from. He remembered those kind of days. He went over there and he helped the little boy get his brother and put him back up in the wheelchair. He felt so ashamed. He felt so awful. He said, as he drove away, he said, I'll never forget the day the thing that I prize most got hit by a brick. Matter of fact, I never wanted to forget that day. So I never did fix the dent in my Jaguar. I wanted it to forever help me remember where I came from. Where I came from. See, if we forget where we come from, we're in deep, deep trouble. I'm going to end with a passage of scripture here. I didn't get it in time to them to put it on here. But it's in Luke writing, the 13th chapter, the sixth verse. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming. You know, Jesus has been there three years, basically. Been here three years now, and I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree. Haven't found any. He said, cut down, cut it down. Why should I use up the soil for it? Verse 8, sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it 
I'll dig around it and I'll fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If it does not, then I'll cut it down. I started to call this, this sermon today, Ding It or Dung It. And the reason, because the old Bible I used to use was called the King James Version. And the King James Version don't say fertilizer, it says dung. Dig around the fig tree. You know, dung happens if you don't know what dung is. Dung happens. I just want to tell you this. God expects, as our Lord and Savior, He expects our obedience that we follow His commands. He expects our presence in the house of the Lord on the Sabbath. He expects us giving our very best to Him, not our worst, not our leftover, not all the time we got left over. He expects the best we have. He expects us to bear fruit. And if we don't bear fruit, he'll start digging around us. And if you still don't bear enough fruit, he'll dung you. I'm gonna tell you something. You might have been a hit with a brick lately. God may be trying to get your attention. If you don't pay attention to the brick, the next thing, you might get dunged. Read the story about Pharaoh, the way that God tried to get Pharaoh's attention kept escalating and escalating and escalating and escalating. God would rather you come by the invitation of a still small voice because he wants you to have freedom. He wants you to have rest. He wants you to have peace. But because he loves you so much, if you don't come, if you don't serve, if you don't bear fruit, it's not past him to get your attention with a brick or some frogs or a plague, or something because he loves you. I think about this. He said, you got one more year. You got one more year. The Bible says God's spirit will not always strive with man. You got one more year. He told that fig tree, you got one more year. I expect some fruit. Maybe God's saying that to us today. Don't forget God. Remember the important things. Some way in your home, build a monument where you can tell your kids right there is where God did that. And I want you to know something. You know, God, write a prayer journal. Do something. Tell your kids, I want you to read this. This is what God done. This is why you're born. We have been told that we couldn't have any kids. The doctor told my wife, you cannot have any kids. We went to an old-fashioned revival. It was a school called Spiritual Emphasis Week. And a minister laid hands on my wife and prayed for her. And, and she was healed. She went to the doctor three or four months later, not feeling well. And the doctor said, uh, you're not sick, you're pregnant. We go, well, we've been told we can't have no kids. Well, you can now. I'm telling you, we're serving a miracle-working God. But he expects our obedience. He expects us to follow his commands. He expects us to bear fruit. He expects our very best. And you will see God open up ways in your life that you've never, ever imagined. I want you to take the communion today. There's a little piece there. You pull off the first layer there. Because this is the new covenant not the old covenant, it's not the Passover meal, it's not the old covenant, it's the new covenant that Jesus put in order with us. He said, I want you to take this. If you don't have communion today, lift your hand and we've got somebody to bring it to you right away. Lift your hand if you don't have a cup right here. Keep your hand up where we'll be able to see in the... There's somebody coming right here. 
Anybody else that wants to take communion, if you don't have a cup, raise your hand. Bread and a cup. This is a very special day to me. I can imagine what it must have been there on that last supper. Jesus stood there and he took that bread, loaf of bread and lifted it up and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. He didn't say how often. He said, as often as you do it, take, eat, and remember some man. God, may we never forget the sacrifice for our freedom, for our rest, for our peace that passes all understanding. After that, he lifted up the cup. He said, this is the New Testament in my blood. Take, drink, and remember some me. He was starting a new covenant with us. A covenant that says he would never hold our sins ever against us again. That gives us peace, folks. Take, drink. i like to come down. I want everybody to stand. We're going to pray for anybody that would like prayer today. If you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior today would be a great day to find Jesus where you get a brick or you get dumped. Of course, I'm kidding. God comes first general, but he loves you enough. He'll do whatever it takes for you to come to Christ. I want us to sing this song together as we're praying for people. Are you grateful today? This song talks about the gratefulness of God and what he's done for us. Sing it together. But for your grace, I could not be saved. But for your Oh